Okay, so let's make an effort to get caught up. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about different systems of government. And you can see here that I've got a map of the world indicating three different countries that have one of three different forms of government. Unitary, confederal, and federal systems of government. For those of you who have taken the 2305 class, you already have some sense of what we mean, I guess, probably, if you remember your 2305, uh, some sense of what we mean by uh, these three different forms of government. Most countries in the world today have either a unitary system or a federal system, okay? So that's the main distinction that we want to make, but we, we want to touch on all three of them. So let's begin with unitary systems, okay? And a unitary, all, I tell you what, let me put it this way. All systems of government in the world today have some split between a central government authority and then regional governments, okay? That owes to the large size of modern nation states. Uh, that is to say, most countries uh, govern a lot of territory and a lot of people, okay? So sort of as a practical matter, uh, there has to be some uh, arrangement where you have a central government and then some regional authorities. The real question is, what is the nature of the relationship between the central government and the regional authorities? So, uh, as I say, most countries in the world uh, would be characterized as either a unitary system or a federal system. So let's make that distinction. In a unitary system of government, uh, the central government has the power. Okay? Uh, whatever the source of the central government's power is, that's a question that we can leave aside. If it's a democratic republic, then the source of the government's authority is the people. If it's a traditional monarchy, uh, you know, then uh, the king is the sovereign power. Yeah, we'll, as I say, we'll leave that question aside. We're just going to talk here about the division between the central government and regional authority. So in a, in a unitary system of government, the central government has the power. Okay? And it may delegate some power to regional governments. But the regional governments only have authority from the central government. Okay, that's what I'm trying to suggest to you with these arrows. Okay, the central government has the authority, and it may delegate some administrative type authority, even maybe some decision making authority to the regional governments. But in the final analysis, whatever authority the regional governments have comes from the central government. So if the central government can give the authority to the regional governments, then that suggests that it can probably do what? Take it can away. Probably take it away as well. That's right. And that's the characteristic of a unitary system. Okay? Countries, uh, let's list a few countries that are, would be good examples of unitary systems. Uh, the, great, uh, the United Kingdom is a unitary system. Uh, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, would be the sort of regional components, but the central government in London has the authority, and those regional subdivisions really only have authority from, uh, from the central government in London. Some of you may be aware, if you pay attention to the news, that a few months ago they had a referendum in Scotland uh, on uh, a, national, a national referendum, uh, whether or not to break away from the United Kingdom. Uh, anybody know how that turned out? It, the referendum failed, right? So Scotland is still part of the United Kingdom. All right. Uh, Japan is an example of a unitary system. They have, I think, something like 43 regional governments in Japan that they call prefectures. Okay. It's a term you don't hear in this part of the world too much, but that's the term that's used to describe their regional governments. So the central government in Tokyo, then you have these regional prefectures, but whatever authority they have comes from the central government in Tokyo. Saudi Arabia is an example of a unitary system. Here you see the regions of Saudi Arabia. I think there are like 13 of those. But again, the, uh, the ultimately the authority is with the royal family in uh, Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. Okay, 
confederal systems of government represent sort of the opposite side of the coin. Okay? In a confederal system of government, the regional governments have the power, and they may delegate some decision-making authority to the central government or some administrative authority to the central government. But again, whatever authority the, the central government has comes from the regional governments, and if the regional governments can delegate that authority, they must also be able to take it away, right? Now, there aren't very many examples of confederal systems in the world, either today or historically. Uh, if we want to appeal to history, probably a pretty good example for us would be the United States in the period from 1776 to 1789, when the United States, before the Constitution went into effect, when the United States were governed under the Articles of Confederation, right? the United States was a confederacy. <coughs> The United, uh, the United States under the Articles of Confederation really functioned as a treaty organization. In fact, the Articles of Confederation themselves referred to the United States as a league of mutual friendship among sovereign states. So the, the uh, Virginia, in other words, in a sense, each of the 13 states were separate countries. Virginia, in effect, was a separate country. Uh, Georgia... North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, all of them were essentially in independent sovereign states or countries, and the Articles of Confederation was like a treaty among those sovereign nations. Now, it didn't take very long for the Americans to figure out that that was not a feasible arrangement. You may remember from your 2305 course or maybe your American history course that by 1786, Certainly 1787, it was apparent to many leading Americans that greater unity was needed among the states, greater union was needed, and that's what led to uh, the drafting and ultimately the ratification of the Constitution. But at least historically, that would be an example. Uh, the former republics of the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, 1990, 1991, uh, somewhere around in there, the former republics of the Soviet Union formed an organization called the Commonwealth of Independent States. And you don't hear too much about the Commonwealth of Independent States in 2015. I don't know if it still exists or not, to be quite frank. If it does, it's little more than a paper organization, because we know that Russia uh, and, um, you know, uh, Belarus and uh, Ukraine, uh, which was originally part of that uh, Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, not only is there a, a good deal of independence among those, but uh, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, obviously lots of antagonism currently. Okay? So whether it exists currently or not, I, I have to be honest with you, I don't know uh, which countries would still belong to the Commonwealth of Independent States. If it does exist, I really I don't know the answer to that either. Uh, but I, th I think, you know, for a brief period of history there in the early 1990s, this would have been a good example of a confederacy. Okay? The United Nations is probably the best example of a confederacy today. The 193 members of the United Nations retain their sovereignty, they retain their independence, and there are some central organs of the United Nations. Notably, there is the Security Council and the General Assembly, but both of those uh, organs of the United Nations really ho only have authority from the member nations. They have really no more authority than the member nations are willing to give. And as I say, each of the member nations retain their independence and their sovereignty. Good heavens, for example, in the United States, we're not go about to give up our sovereignty to the United Nations, right? The United Nations, I think, when I say it's a good example of a confederacy today, I think it illustrates why confederacies, there aren't, uh, there aren't very many confederacies uh, historically or today, uh, and the ones that have existed aren't terribly effective. I think most people would say that the United Nations is not terribly effective as a form of government. It's generally only effective if one of the member nations a particularly influential member of the United Nations is willing to sort of step up and uh, execute the will of the United Nations. <coughs> okay. 
somewhere positioned in between, I suppose, a unitary system, which is what? What's a unitary system? What's sort of the defining characteristic? Central government has the power. The central government has the power, and it may delegate authority to the regional governments. Confederacies, the regional governments have the power, and they may delegate power to the central government. Yeah, uh, Trev, did you? Um, what is this, the sovereign part? What is that that keeps popping Sovereign up? means the ultimate source of political authority. Okay? So in a democratic republic, the people are sovereign. In the United States is a democratic republic. It's based on the principle of popular sovereignty. Particularly, we see that in the opening words of the Constitution, right? We say, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, and so on and so forth, establish government. The Constitution, one of the major purposes of the Constitution is to establish that government, whether we're talking about the central government or the regional government, gets its authority from the people. Okay? That's very powerfully communicated just with the preamble of the Constitution. In other democratic systems, it's basic whether they have a written constitution that begins with we the people or not. And I was saying that's the basic principle of a democratic republic, is that um, the power come, the power of government, the source of government's power is the people. The same thing is true in a constitutional monarchy. Okay? For example, in the UK, it's not a republic. The United Kingdom is not a republic. It is a... A monarchy, but it's what we call a constitutional monarchy. It's not like Saudi Arabia, right? Saudi Arabia is a monarchy as well, but and so Britain, are we saying that Britain has a monarchy and Saudi Arabia has a monarchy, therefore they essentially have the same kind of government? No. no of course not, right? What's the difference? Well, in Great Britain, the monarchy's power is basically symbolic, and the uh, the, the real power of government rests with Parliament, but where does Parliament's authority come from? It comes from the people. It's a democratic system. It may not be a republic system, a republican system, but it's a democratic system. In a country like Saudi Arabia, who's got the who's got the power? Who's ultimately the seat, got the, the power? King Sheik. Right, the prince. Well, the prince died a couple of weeks ago. I right? but, uh, yeah. who, whoever's emerging now as the. I, I don't it's know, his but, but still the royal family, yeah, right? Royal yeah. Okay, so that's that's the difference in terms. You know, your, if your question is, what does the word sovereign mean? It just means ultimately who has the political power. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So now in a federal system, what we see is that the uh, division of powers between the central and go central government and the regional governments on the one hand is not doesn't suggest a hierarchy, right? In in a Confederacy, the, the power flows from central from regional governments to central government, and from in a unitary system it flows from central government to regional governments. But in a federal system, we see that the central government has its own base of of governing authority, and the regional governments have their own base of governing authority. Okay, so we'll say a lot more about federal systems here in just a moment. Obviously, the American system is, a, is an example of a federal system. Let's get a few others, though. India is an example of a federal system. There you see the uh, regional subdivisions of India. Nigeria is a federal system. Germany is a federal system. There you see the states of Germany. Westphalia, Hessen, Bavaria. Etc. So just like we have Texas and Louisiana and Oregon, they have Bavaria and Westphalia and Hessen. Brazil is a federal system. My guess is that as the Olympic Games approach, the next Olympic Games approach, you'll hear lots more in the news about Brazil and maybe even their form of government. Wait, the, the Olympics are going to be in Brazil? I think so. Isn't the, the next Olympics yeah. in, Br in Brazil? Mm -hmm. yeah. In Brazil? Where's Rio? I don't see it. <laughs> Canada is a federal system. They don't call their regional governments states in Canada. They call them provinces. Nevertheless, just like we have Montana and North Dakota and Idaho, they have Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, among others. Mexico is a federal system. There you see the 28 
or so states of Mexico. So we have Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. They have Sonora, Chihuahua, and Cohia. What? No, nothing. I was joking. I said that's where Chihuahuas come from, right? I don't know. Maybe so. <laughs> have you have any of you ever traveled in Mexico? Yes. You ever looked at a Mexican peso? Yeah. Yeah. I, on there. I have. Los Estados Unidos, they make I am Mexican. No, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 what does that mean? Los Estados Unidos, they make Yeah, the United States of Mexico. Okay. So they have their states. We have ours. Here's a look at the American system, of course. Um, let's talk about some of the... Um, some of the characteristics of federal systems in general. <laughs> and again, for those of you who've had the government 2305 class, this will be a little bit of review, but I think it's, a, it's an important starting point for us to build on. Okay, so federal system, a federal system is one in which governmental powers are constitutionally divided between two levels, a central government and then regional governments. And of course, in the United States, we say national government and states. As we've seen, the United States is one of many federal systems in the world today. We've seen a few examples. But all federal systems have no a number of important characteristics in common. So let me tick these off for you real quick. First of all, there's a constitutional division of governmental powers responsibilities such that each level is autonomous in at least one sphere of action. Federalism means that there's a division of powers between two levels of government, central and regional. What do we call the central government in the United States? Congress. Well, sometimes people say the word, fe okay, everybody pause here for just a second, okay? A lot of times when people are describing American government, they'll say the federal government in Washington. Okay? They're say, you know, the, the, what they're really talking about is the national government. My point to you is that the whole thing is federal, right? Not only the national government in Washington, but the 50 states make up the federal system. Okay? So even though people routinely say, you know, I, my question was, what do we call the central government in the United States? And you said the, cent you said the federal government. You, you're, uh, lots of people do that. Lots of people you know, will misappropriate that word federal. I think it's actually more accurate for us to say national government. Okay? So the central government in the United States is the national government, the government in Washington, D.C. Okay? And then you have the, the regional governments, which are the 50 state governments. Okay? But the key is that, okay, so there's a division of powers between the government in Washington and the governments of the 50 states. There's some things that the national government does. There's some things that the state governments do. But the real defining characteristic that separates a federal system from either a unitary system or a confederal system is that each government is final and supreme, or excuse me, is autonomous in at least one sphere of action. So I guess the question then becomes, well, what does that word autonomous mean? What do we mean if we say that each government is autonomous in at least one sphere of action? Well, that means there has to be at least one thing that the national government can do under its own authority, and at least one thing that the states can do under their own authority. Now, the fact of the matter is, in the American federal system, there are many areas of autonomy. There are many things that the national government can do under its own authority. There are many things that the state governments can do under their own authority. But the defining characteristic is, is there has to be at least one. <laughs> so give me an example of something that the national government, a power that the national government can do under its own authority. That it doesn't have to get the permission of the states to do it, so to speak. Impeach the president? Declare war? 
Okay, Pets. let's start with that one, declare war. Okay, clearly the United States government can declare war on another country. Have we ever done that? Yeah. Sure. yeah. When's the last time we did that? Iraq. Nope. nope. Afghanistan. That okay. wasn't a war. war too. Okay. Actually, the last time the United States government declared war on another country was World War II. When it declared war, when it declared war on Germany and Japan and, and Japan. Italy. Japan. Yeah. But uh, certainly we've engaged in military operations since <laughs> then. But... It's, it's in terms of formal declarations of war, the last time was World War II. Now, there's no question that the national government can do that, right? That's in the Constitution. The Constitution says Congress will have the power to declare war. Okay? All right, so that's one. Give me another one. Something that the national government can do without having to have the permission of the states. Send ambassadors to other countries. What was that? Send ambassadors Somebody. to other countries. One more time. She says send ambassadors to other countries. Okay, so have diplomatic relations with other countries by sending ambassadors and so on. Yep, that's something the national government can do. Somebody here at Sugarland said uh, impose taxes. The national government can impose taxes without having to get the permission of the state. Yeah, that's true. That's right. Uh, absolutely. In fact, the national government imposes a variety of taxes under its own authority. Okay, now give me something that the states can do under their own authority. Um, under very limited circumstances, uh, but let's, let's think of something that would be more typical. Yeah. Texas can secede. Nope. Tex? Absolutely not. <laughs> we fought an entire war about that, right? Civil war. Right? State tax. States can also impose taxes under their own authority, right? So, for example, if the state of Texas wanted to impose a sales tax, it could do that, right? It doesn't have to get the permission of Congress to do that or the president to do that, right? Absolutely. So, when we say autonomous, we don't mean that one can do it and the other can't. In fact, there are many areas of autonomous authority where both the national government and the state governments can to undertake that authority. If we're talking about a power that the national government can do, but the state governments can't do it, that's what we call an exclusive power. Okay? And the power to declare war would be a good example of, the, of an exclusive power. The power to coin money would be an example of an exclusive power of the national government. Yeah. Can't the state uh, uh, change their budget? Yeah, I mean, that would fall under the general legislative power of a state, and the states do have authority to legislate generally. Okay, so absolutely. Second point, each government, in other words, the national government in its area of autonomous authority and the state governments in their areas of autonomous authority are final and supreme. In a federal system, if it is an autonomous power of the national government, when the national government acts, it's final and supreme. If it's an autonomous power of the state governments, when the state governments act, it's final and supreme. It's a characteristic of a federal system. All right, everybody with me on that? So if the state of Texas wanted to impose an income tax, do we have an income tax in Texas? No. Yes. We don't have a state income tax. Texans pay federal income tax, but we don't have a state income tax. Is anybody here from the out of state? Who's from out of state? Where, what other states have you lived in? Vegas. Nevada? Yeah. Um, Washington. They have an income tax in Nevada. I don't think so. There's, there's uh, only a handful of states that no longer, that still do not have state income taxes. I think something like 38 states have income taxes. So I'll take your word for it. Nevada's not one. I'm not 100%. Yeah, I'm not either. I, I'm, I don't know either. It wouldn't be that hard for us to find out, though. Uh, I, I can only say with certainty that Texas is one that doesn't have a state income tax. So you're going to have to suspend reality here for a moment for, for purposes of illustration because Texas doesn't have a state income tax. And frankly, it's not likely that Texas will adopt an income tax anytime soon. But just to carry this through, this illustration through, let's say that the legislature in Austin decides to impose an income tax on the state. Assume, assuming that everything is done according to you know, what's required in Texas, they adopt the state income tax. Can the United States Congress come along after the fact 
and repeal the income tax in Texas. We don't want Texas having a state income tax. We're repealing that income tax. No. I see one person shaking his head, yes. No. Any other thoughts? No. No, they can't. No, that's right, they can't. Okay? The Congress couldn't, if, if, state, if Texas decided to impose a state income tax, Congress could not reverse that. Okay? Because it's an autonomous power of the state, and when the state exercises that power, it's final and supreme. You say, hold on a second, Fagan. I have, I may not, you know, be an expert on these things, but I've certainly heard stories of, you know, state laws being invalidated or state laws being struck down. For example, maybe the United States Supreme Court strikes down a state law um, that, um, oh, good heavens, let's go back a dozen years. Uh, in 2003, in a very uh, famous or infamous case, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, called Lawrence and Garner versus Texas. The United States Supreme Court struck down a Texas law that made homosexual sodomy a crime. It was a criminal act in Texas mm -hmm. to engage in an act of homosexual sodomy. And the United States Supreme Court struck that down. Now, something must not be right about what I'm telling you because if the state of Texas enacted that law, is it not final and supreme? How would you explain that to someone who doesn't, you know, really understand this idea of how our federal system works? How can an institution of the national government, the United States Supreme Court, strike down a state law if, in fact, this is correct, this notion of being final and supreme? If it's deemed unconstitutional? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the key phrase here is in its constitutionally assigned sphere, right? So apparently the state of Texas had enacted that law. It was not an autonomous power of the state of Texas. It was not within its constitutionally assigned sphere. So when you see the United States Supreme Court striking down state laws, whatever they have to deal with, okay, it doesn't violate this, these characteristics that we're laying out here about federalism. It just means that the state assumes some power that didn't belong to it, okay? Good. All right, next, both levels of government may act directly on individual citizens. This is a big deal. This is a big difference between a federal system as the United States is under the Constitution and a confederacy as the United States was under the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles of Confederation, for example, the national government could not act directly on individual citizens. It couldn't impose taxes on individual citizens. It couldn't regulate the behavior of individual citizens. It couldn't raise an army. It couldn't, cons for example, it c Congress could not conscript individuals into the Continental Army, okay, which posed severe problems for the United States in those early years. Because remember, they still were waging that war of revolution against Britain. You know, just because they declared their independence in 1776 didn't mean it was a done deal, right? They still had to wage the war of rebellion, and that lasted until, what, 1781, I think, right? So, so five years. And Congress had a very difficult time uh, executing that war because uh, it couldn't conscript individuals into the Continental Army. It could only request militia from the states. And oftentimes the states didn't comply with those requests. But that's a key difference between a confederacy and a federal system. I think it's worth noting that one of the specific issues that the framers of the Constitution dealt with in drafting that document in 1787 was to give Congress the authority to raise armies and navies. They put that specifically into the Constitution as a power of the national government because it was a response to this very difficult time that they had had during the uh, revolutionary period. So both levels, both the national government and the state governments can act directly on individual citizens. <coughs> both, levels may de both levels derive their authority from the sovereign rather than from one another. And as we've already established in response to a question, the sovereign means what? Who or what is sovereign? The people, the power. Oh. right? Both levels of government. Both the national government, 
the national government, whatever authority it has, comes from the people. The state government, whatever authority the state governments have, comes from the people. Since both levels of government derive their authority from the people rather than from one another, therefore neither can unilaterally change the relationship. The national government can't modify the powers of the states. The state governments can't modify the powers of the national government. You can probably appreciate how that would be possible here, right? It would be possible for the central government to modify the powers of the regional governments in a unitary system. It would be possible for the regional governments to modify the powers of the central government in a unitary system. But here, the central government can't modify the regional government's powers. The regional governments can't modify the central government's powers. Why? Because they get their power from the people in the first place. Now, can the powers of the national government be changed? Yeah, they can. Can the powers of the state governments be changed? Yes. How? Through the people. Okay. Through the people, I guess, is the general sort of philosophical answer, but the more specific answer is through a formal constitutional amendment process. Okay. All right, good. Finally, the regional governments, that is, in the United States, the states, exist in their own right. In the United States, Texas exists in its own right. Arizona exists in its own right. Maine exists in its own right, etc. The regional governments exist in their own right. They can't. As a practical matter, what what does that mean? Well, it means that a state can't be abolished, right? So it's not like, for example, up in Washington, they can say. We've had enough of you people down there in Texas. We'll show you don't mess with Texas. <laughs> You're out. They can't do that, right? Once the people of the state of Texas are part of the United States, they can't be kicked out. And it works the other way, too, as I always like to point out. It also means that once the people of a state are part of the union, they can't secede. Oh man, so we're stuck. <laughs> the 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 ship. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why would that matter? Um, if the, you're talking about the people of the state of Texas, are, are you saying that Texans have some idea that because Texas was once an independent republic, that it can? Secede, withdraw from the United States. No, no I'm saying that because it's the wealthiest. The wealthiest. Um, and, and most of the and most of the military come from Texas. Do we have our own? Well, people say lots of things. Right? California was, I suppose, would qualify them too. I'm going to look at a like, movie stars that go. They aren't, they aren't even relevant. <laughs> you have your hand up. I'm late. Oh, so so Texas couldn't couldn't secede. Are you sorry? Like like under no. We would have to wait for word to get. Well, I mean, I mean, we we know. Know. remember the military comes from Texas. Remember Texas attempted to secede in the Civil War era, right? Together with the other so-called Confederate states. They may have thought they seceded, but and it may have had to be established by military conquest. But in a sense, that's what the Civil War was about, right? The question of whether or not the states could secede. One of the very important questions that the Civil War was about, whether or not the states could secede. Of course, it was Lincoln's absolute conviction that no state could, on its own resolve, secede. That that was that the the union of the the union of the people of the states was perpetual, and it was as it was as um, it was as uh, cohesive and perpetual for the states that were in existence at the time of the Civil War as it was for the original thirteen states. That was certainly Lincoln's uh, conviction that.
And the, ma the motivation for the Civil War in Lincoln's mind was to uphold that principle that states cannot secede. Just upset Kylie. She really was a stupid was thinking that we could secede. All right, so questions about any of these points on federalism? Texans do have a lot of mythology, and one of the one of the myths that many Texans seem to hold is, and I, because I've heard many people say this, I'm not I'm not uh, singling anyone out. I've heard many people over the years say that well, Texas is the only state that can secede if it wants to. La 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 la. Kylie. <laughs> <laughs> Kylie, what do you think? I, I'm not sure exactly where that mythology comes from. Uh, but it certainly uh, didn't stand up to the scrutiny of the Civil War, I guess. Okay, anything else? Other questions about these points on federalism? Okay, so what all this means is that the powers of government are divided between national government and 50 state governments. They derive their authority from the Constitution, but we have the question about how the Constitution divides governmental powers between the national government and the state governments. So here's the way that you need to understand this division of powers. The Constitution delegates certain powers to the national government. The Constitution delegates certain powers to the national government. We say that the national government is a government of delegated or enumerated powers. In theory, what that means is that whatever powers the national government has can be found in the Constitution. They're listed in the Constitution. The state governments are governments of reserve powers, which means that any power that's not delegated to the national government is a power that's reserved to the states. Now, does anyone have any clue, any guess, as to what it can, can point to any evidence, for example, in the Constitution that would give credence to that theory of our division of powers in our federal system? I meant to call this up and I forgot. Bear with me for just a second. Anybody? Remember? Do you remember from your government 2305 course? Second, I can't multitask. Okay, my question is: do, do you know of any? Do you have anything that you can point to? Any evidence that would? Give us reason to believe that that theory of the Constitution is actually the reality. What's the theory? The powers of the national government are delegated by the Constitution. Any power that's not delegated to the national government is a power that's reserved to the states. I tell you what, let's do it this way. Let me, let me just illustrate for you very quickly what we mean by delegated powers. Okay, here I've got the Constitution of the United States. All right. Now I'm going to scroll down. Article 1 is the article of the Constitution that deals with Congress. Now I'm going to scroll down to Section 8 of Article 1. Notice that the first sentence there of Section 8 says, Congress shall have the power to. And then it begins to enumerate or list all of the things that Congress shall have the power to do. Right. Congress will have the power to lay and collect taxes. Congress will have the power to pay the debts of the United States. Congress will have the power to provide for the common defense of the United States. Congress will have the power to provide for the general welfare of the United States. Congress will have the power to borrow money on the credit of the United States. Congress will have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with Indian tribes. Congress will have the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Congress will have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof, and so on. It continues, right, through Section 8. That's, those are the delegated powers of Congress. Now, if we wanted to find the delegated powers of the President, where do you think we would look? 
somewhere far down. This is Article 1. Two. Article 1 is the article that deals with Congress. Article 2, then. How about Article 2? Good guess. All right? We look at Article 2, which deals with the President, and we can find in Article 2 some of the, delega the delegated powers of the President. Among those are the power to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur, the power to appoint, appoint ambassadors, uh, ministers, of other public consuls, federal judges, etc., the power to veto laws passed by Congress. Okay, so there are a number of delegated powers of Congress. And I suppose if we wanted to know what the delegated powers were of the courts, we would look at Article 3, right? Because that's the theory of our Constitution, that whatever powers Congress has, whatever powers the President has, whatever powers the courts have, more generally, whatever powers the national government has are delegated by the Constitution. Okay, so everybody's, everybody's down with that now, right? What we mean by delegated powers or enumerated powers. All right, now what about the powers of the states? Article 4, 3. Oh, 4. No, it's not yes. Bill of Rights. What about the Bill of Rights? Are you just like tossing something out there or do you have reason to point us to the Bill of Rights? Is it because you saw me open the document that says the Bill of Rights? Um, All right, well now you got to be more specific. Preamble. Is it the Tenth Amendment? The preamble, the, maybe? Good, the Tenth Amendment. Look at the language of the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment says, the powers not delegated to the United States. You can substitute for the words United States their national government, because that's what that means. The powers not delegated to the national government by the Constitution, nor prohibited by the Constitution to the states, are reserved to the states respectively. Okay? So, where do we find the delegated powers of the national government? One and two. In the Constitution. Okay? It's good, you know, Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution. Okay? It's particularly article The conference is about to end. If it's a power that's not listed in the Constitution as a power of the national government, then it is a power that is reserved to the states by virtue of what? The Tenth Amendment. Okay? That's what the Tenth Amendment does. It says any power that is not given by the Constitution to the national government is a power that's reserved to the states. That's how power, in our, in our federal system, that's how power is divided between the national government and the state government. So now, let's finish on this point. If you ever have a question, or your person sitting next to you, or your cousin, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or your mom, or your dad, ever have a question about whether something is a power of the national government or a power of the state governments in our system, you can tell them how to answer that question, right? What would you tell them? If your best friend comes up to you and says, you know, I don't understand all of this stuff that we, all this debate that we're having in this country today about marriage. Uh, whose authority is it anyway to determine who can get married and who can't get married, or who can license marriages? Is it a power of the national government or is it a power of the state governments? State. Well, you're telling me it's a power of the state governments. How do you know? Because there's nothing in the Constitution that says it's a power of the national government, right? And so if it's not listed in the Constitution as a power of the national government, it must be a power that's reserved to the states. Now, that's an issue that is framed in terms of what la how much latitude do the states have under the Constitution to determine who can and who can't get married. Can states, like Texas, for example, determine that a marriage can only be between one man and one woman? Well... That will have to be that question will have to be answered by the courts, right? But it doesn't change the basic fact that the states determine who to license to be married. Okay, all right. We'll see you on uh, Wednesday.